please follow him on uh, Twitter. You will find his Twitter account, Twitter handle in the chat and also check out his latest paper. Without any further ado, please go on. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Maria, for introducing me. And uh, I want to first thank the organizers the Normatch Academy. I also wear my Norma uh, Normatch Conference. I also wear my Normatch Academy t-shirt here. I had a great time at Normatch Academy and uh, I'm, I'm really grateful that they gave me the opportunity to present my work at Normatch Conference. Uh, before I start, uh, I should uh, thank my uh, great colleagues, Paul Hage and JP, and that helped me in this work and um, specifically my amazing mentor, uh, Reza, um, that, that's kind of the backbone of the lab. So the, uh, without further ado, so my uh, talk today is about population coding of psychotic eye movements by Perpinji cells of the marmoset cerebellum. So my talk today will be about this cute, very, uh, kind of amazing and new animal, um, non-human animal models, namely uh, marmoset monkeys. And uh, I'm going to present the data uh, that are recorded from cerebellum. So the other two talks were about the cortex. This talk is uh, more about the cerebellum and specifically about the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum. Um, just to give you a background, um, the cerebellum uh, is uh, where that we think is that uh, responsible for encoding of the internal uh, models and the motor commands. And, but uh, a major difficulty in the field has been to understand the coding of the, uh, that uh, the, the cerebral Purkinje cells are doing. Uh, and let me actually, sorry. And um, so recently uh, we published two papers in the nature and uh, nature neuroscience that we uh, show the results that we can use a framework. And this framework is about the population coding of, of Birkin G cells and how this population is getting formed is based on the preference for error of each Birkin G cell. And when we put the Birkin G cells based on the preference for error, then we can have a coordinate system and using that coordinate system, we'll, we were able to uh, make sense of the activity of the Purkinje cells. That work was in uh, macaque monkeys. Uh, here we expand uh, that work and we expand it to using uh, marmoset monkeys. So first of all, uh, we want to prove that marmoset monkeys are reliable and very promising new non-human animal models for studying sensory motor learning and a specific specifically psychotic eye movements. And we test um, kind of the generality of our hypothesis. So we record from Purkinje cells of the cerebellum and see if uh, we can use the same coordinate system and, and the same framework to make sense of the activity of the Purkinje cells of the marmoset cerebellum. Uh, so we previously published our uh, findings about how to train marmoset monkeys, how to do surgery on them, and also how to, because there is no reliable brain atlas for marmoset mon monkeys right now, kind of general use like what we have for macaque and also the uh, mouse. And um, But uh, we also introduced how we can come up with a very accurate uh, targeting of different brain uh, areas. And uh, please uh, go ahead and read that paper. Uh, anyway, okay, so now let's focus here on our task. So our task is a psychotic eye movement task. What we do is that we'll present a center target and the monkey is tasked to fixate at the center target for about 200 milliseconds. After the fixation point, uh, we'll make a sound and then we'll jump the target to a new location. So this target will disappear a new target will appear as you can see here and the monkey is tasked to make a, a primary saccade. When we detect the onset of the primary saccade, uh, we jump the target to a new location. So this will disappear and uh, target will go to a new location. So what will happen is that since we uh, do the secondary jump at the saccade onset, so this will happen during uh, when the eye is uh, kind of in the travel. Uh, so, and as you know, uh, the eye is basically blind and during the saccade. So the monkey will not see the second uh, jump. And when the eye lands at this location, the target is no longer there, it's a new location. And this is what we call the uh, sensory predictioner because the monkey predicted that the target should be there, but the target is a new location. And as a result of this secondary jump, and uh, the monkey will make another saccade, what we call a corrective saccade. And uh, monkey's task is to fixate at the secondary location for 200 milliseconds and after 
calculate that the monkey will receive its reward. Uh, here is the eye trajectories for a sample session. A monkey is fixating at the center point. The target is jumping to one of the randomly eight and choose uh, locations and the monkey makes the, the primary saccade. Then after that, we again jump the target to one of the eight uh, new locations and the monkey will make a corrective saccade. Okay, while the monkey is doing these tasks, the saccadic eye movement tasks, we're recording from the cerebellum. And we are specifically recording from a specific type of cells. And those cells are Purkinje cells. And how we define that we are recording actually from Purkinje cells is by using um, the simple spike and complex spikes. So we are detecting these complex spikes and these complex spikes are the unique signature of Purkinje cells. And using these complex spikes, seeing that we have the complex spikes is a proof that we are actually recording from Purkinje cells. Okay, so what is simple spike and what is a complex spike? So simple spikes are um, the usual spikes that other cells also have, they are about between 50 hertz to 60 hertz. And one of the signatures of the simplest spike of the Purkinje cells is that they had this um, kind of uh, extra bump after the refractory period. But what is unique about Purkinje cells, as I told you, is that they also have complex spikes. And uh, complex spikes are complex. And, but uh, these are unique spikes. These are rare spikes. So they fire about one hertz, just one hertz. So every second or every other second, you get one of those. And they're actually uh, getting produced by a different mechanism in the cell. So as simple spikes are the usual sodium potassium channels, uh, complex spikes are getting generated by calcium channels. And uh, the way to make sure that you're recording from a Purkinje cell is by what we call a suppression in the simplest spike due to a complex spike. So what I uh, plot for you here is a cross probability. Uh, at time zero, we had a complex spike. And what you can see here is that after happening of a complex spike, there is a longer refractory period for a simple spike and simple spike and the cell does not fire any simple spike for a longer period of time. The same data has been plotted here. So what you can see is that at this time, we have all the complex spike. Before a complex spike happened, you can have simple spike all the way up to the complex and uh, to the complex spike, but after complex spike is happening, we have a long period of time of the silence. And then after that period, uh, simple spikes start to fire and coming up. So we use uh, these simple spike and uh, complex spike framework to make sure that we are um, actually uh, recording from Purkinje cells. Okay, great. And uh, now, uh, Let's focus on the encoding of the ongoing saccade in the cerebellum. So first, uh, what I'm plotting for you here is eight directions that I show you as a sample session. So we had eight directions. I mark for you the saccade onset and saccade offset. If I plot the raster plots for simple spikes, what you can see here is that this Purkinje cell, the sample Purkinje cell, do actually show modulation for saccadic eye movements. But if you zoom in a little bit more, what you can see is that uh, the activity of this Purkinje cell is very complex and it's not consistent. For example, uh, for some direction is bursting before the saccade and pausing during the saccade. For other direction is pausing and bursting. In some direction is just pausing without any bursting. And, and it's very complex. So there is no consistent uh, kind of behavior of the cell for different directions or, and this, this has been a very, very challenging task um, in the field that by looking just at the Purkinje cell, there is no very clear uh, understanding of what does this Purkinje cell is doing during the saccade. But uh, the Purkinje cells does not just have simple spike, they also have complex spike. Now, what I'm plotting here for you is the complex spikes of this Purkinje cell. If you now look at the complex spike activity, what you can see here is that the complex spikes uh, in the right barcicas are having more probability of firing than the left barcica. And if you put them as a tuning, what you can see for this cell is that this cell is actually have a complex spike tuning for a uh, rightward saccade. So although the simplest spike might be very complex and does not have a very unique way of encoding, 
And complex bugs do show uh, directional tuning for uh, different directions. Okay, now using this framework, let's look at the population of Birkin G cells. So now uh, in this slide, I'm going to show you the complex bike population tuning or coding. And then the next slide, I will show you the simplest bike coding. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, for each cell, we detect the direction that that cell has the maximum probability of firing a complex bike. And we call that direction CSR. And uh, of course, since we define the CSR as the maximum probability, you will have the maximum probability of and CS probability in the CSR. And, and, but what is happening is that the direction opposite to CSR will always have a reduction uh, and lower than the average firing rate of the complex bike. And so the CS off, uh, just by aligning things to CS on, you will get a CS off or CS 180 that will has uh, lower than the average uh, fire firing for the complex bike. Now let's focus more on the CS on direction. So what we saw is that after presenting the primary stimulus, uh, we saw an increase in the firing of the complex bike. And if we now uh, align the same data to the saccade onset, so uh, not just presenting this, but when the saccade is actually happening, what we saw is that right after the saccade onset, the, although that we had an increase in the complex bike uh, firing rate before the saccade, just right after the saccade onset, the complex bike will go to the baseline. And after uh, the, uh, after the second, it will go all the way uh, uh, even more down. Now, if I focus on the corrective saccade, we saw uh, again the same thing that we had increase in the activity after uh, experience of the sensory error and going to the baseline during the saccade and going below the baseline uh, after the saccade finish. Now, if I, and um, this was for, uh, CS on, if we focus on CS off, and what we see is that, so this is the same thing just for reference. What we see is that in the CS on, we actually see a decrease in the complex bike firing when we experience the sensory error. Okay, great. So we had this, this framework. And um, now if you put the, all these Purkinje cells at the population all together, what we see is that uh, as a population, we can see that the uh, Purkinje cells show an increase in their activity before saccade onset. And during the saccade, they will uh, decrease their activity or we had this disinhibition uh, of activity of Purkinje cells. But what is interesting is that if you now use our That's framework- Please, uh, we're short on time. Uh, okay, uh, I will just finish here. If we uh, use uh, this framework, we see that uh, CS off or CS180 show the maximum uh, uh, firing, although CS on does not show that. So overall, uh, I show you the results that um, the uh, one more serum is a reliable uh, animal model uh, to uh, for the um, sensory motor learning, uh, we recorded from 110 Purkinje cells. When we put the population of the Purkinje cells and when we account for the preference for the error, then we uh, were able to see uh, the SS response of the of the Purkinje cells. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. That's great. Cerebrum is awesome, and we have one question, really one and really short. Yeah, please. How difficult to train marmosets in this task co compared to macaques? This is a question for Manbrot. Um, yeah, uh, that, that's a great question. So in our 2019 um, paper, we explain uh, in, in great details how we train them to do more than 100, uh, well, I'm sorry, 1,000. And all the way, we had a monkey that uh, do 3,000 trial uh, per session. Uh, we uh, spent about one month for training them on this Sikhat task. So I would say they are very convenient and very comparable to macaque monkeys. Okay, cool. So let's have now one really quick one because I thought that you know, we'll have less time. Question for Michelle. Yeah, where do you think the input for this complex spike is coming from? And uh, do you have any circuit for that? Um, yeah, so complex bikes, uh, the input for complex bikes come from inferior olive, and inferior olive receives inputs from all over the brain, and uh, this is an ongoing kind of research, and 
uh, but the simplest box and complex box uh, actually have different inputs. So simplest box, uh, the input for that coming from mossy fibers, uh, mm -hmm. but the input for complex box come from inferior olive. So they also have different uh, inputs. Yeah. Okay, cool, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. It's like amazing session and I wish we had more time.